Um, so I started to neglect other things in my life. And I think that's a really important point just to bring up that you've always got to keep your karate in balance with the rest of your life. You know, everything about what you do should be kept in balance. Welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and this is episode 208. On today's show, we have Sensei J.D. Swanson, scientist by trade, martial artist by choice, and he's written a really interesting book. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts two times each week. Welcome. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to all you returning listeners, and welcome to the new listeners out there. Martial arts, when you get right down to it, can be silly. There are lots of martial arts-related memes out there. You probably see them on social media all the time. But we couldn't find a website dedicated to just those fun memes. So we made one. Check out martialartsmemes.com. I know, we're really creative when we name something. And feel free to submit the memes that we don't have. Like everything we do at Whistlekick, it's because we wanted it ourselves. Many of us dream of training with martial arts heroes, those that we look up to so much. Sensei J.D. Swanson has done more than dream. He's been fortunate enough to train with a number of karate greats. Sensei Swanson has been successful not only in the martial arts, but in academics as a university professor. We've got him on the show today, so let's welcome him. Sensei Swanson, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Yeah, g'day. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and how are you? I'm really good. Now, the listeners are going to hear your accent. They're going to assume that you are much farther away from where I am than you, where you actually are. Yep. So, so let, right now I'm sitting in my Let's get that part office. out of the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. So right now I'm sitting in my office at Salve Regina University, um, but I'm originally from Rotorua, New Zealand. And there we go. So we've got an accent coming to us from America. Exactly. So maybe, maybe, maybe we'll make everybody happy. We, we've, got, we've got international flavor to the American-based show. Well, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sure we're going to hear about martial arts in New Zealand. I'm sure we're going to hear about martial arts in the U.S., maybe even in other places. Before we get into any of that, though, we've got to know some context. We've got to know how you got started, your superhero martial arts origin story, if you will. So why don't you take us a minute tell us how you get going as a martial artist? Yeah, so a really kind of funny story. Um, I was about five years old, and um, we were at some friends of the family's house. And um, I was playing with my friend. He was, you know, he's four, four, five years old. And I threw him onto the ground. And my parents happened to watch it. And they were like, oh, my goodness, what are you doing? You're throwing the, your friend. What's, what's going on? If you're going to learn how to do that, you're going to learn it, how to do it properly. And so what they did was they ripped me down to an old boxing gym that happened to have a karate school um, in it uh, in my hometown of Rotorua. And uh, I remember walking in. The place smelled funny. Um, for anyone that's traveled to New Zealand, uh, Rotorua is really odd. It has a lot of geysers and hot pools. So there's always the smell, sulfur smell, the smell of rotten eggs around the town. And this particular old boxing gym um, had that smell. You know, it's one of those things I'll always associate with my early days of training. And um, the instructor walked in, looked me up and down. And he just said, he ain't going to stick. And so... Uh, I ended up doing my first class, and I still remember it really clearly. We learned maigiri or front kick, and it was literally itch, knee, sun, she, lifting, you know, lifting the leg out, pushing it out, bringing it back, placing it back down. That's all we did, all class. And at the end of the class, the instructor was like, yeah, he's not going to stick. And uh, I kept coming back. And um, after about six months of me just sort of coming back as a five-year-old, my parents, you know, of course, encouraging me, um, the instructor finally said, well, you know, do you want us to join up? Do you want him to start? You know, he's kind of earned that right. And my parents said, well, if we're going to pay that put out the massive investment of $30 to buy you a gi, buy you a uniform and pay the dues and things like that, you have to stay till you're a black belt, you know, and they're looking at me, you know, this little five-year-old and I'm like, okay, that sounds like a really good idea. They held me to it. 14 years later, I finally got to sit my first black belt exam. And so um, really, you know, that's that sort of allowed me the resilience. And, you know, I wanted to quit so many times when I was like seven, eight, you know, when my friends were off doing other things. And uh, I just stuck. I just never, never stopped eventually. And it became part of me. It's part of my blood now. Mm. So you and I have a similar origin story in terms of age and in terms of parental attitudes. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was never laid as as formally to me as it was to you that you are going to stay and and, and make this full commitment to black belt. 
but I can relate to what you're saying with the desire to step away. Yeah, it was the, the club I was in was not, uh, so, you know, now I guess, you know, I look around a lot of the martial arts schools and, you know, they have a lot of kids classes and things like that. And in the very early eighties, um, they just didn't have them. It was, you know, it was, I was like one of maybe two kids that were training, sorry, kids, a baby goat, two children that were training. And, um, that was it. The rest of them were, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds, you know? Um, and so it was tough, you know, and I think there were misunderstandings of actually how karate was done. You know, um, when we did one step, for example, you would block and counterattack and your goal was to hit the person as hard as you could on the counterattack because it would toughen you up, you know, and things like that. You just didn't want to really, you know, as a, as a young, young child, you just didn't want to go and deal with, you know, um, and again, it took a while for you to sort of toughen up, get used to it, and then sort of move on. And it wasn't until much later, I think, till I was like 15, 16, that everything just clicked for me. You know, I'd grown into my body, you know, puberty had hit, you know, normally I joke with my students, say it was 24 when it hit, but, you know, it, it had hit and my limbs had grown in and I was, you know, able to move and really understood how much it sort of um, encapsulated, I think. Interesting. Yeah. Now, when you look back on that time, when you, when you look back on being so much younger than everyone else, uh -huh. knowing what you know now, are you happy that that's the upbringing you had? Do you wish you'd had an alternative path, you know, through a more, let's say, age appropriate class? Or did you take things from being the sort of odd man out? Yeah, no, it was really interesting. I mean, you know, I got funny stories of my best friend and I, you know, we, it used to be the, the dojo was really interesting. It used to be across the road, a fairly busy road from a, a horse track, you know, and, and you end up with all these funny experiences. Like I remember we used to do line work around this course track, you know, that would be our training or you'd run around the horse track, you know, for the, the first time. And I remember one day running along and, you know, the assistant instructor came along, picked us both up by the belts and he's doing arm curls while he's running along with us, you know, <laughs> this kind of just silly things. Um, but you know, so, so you had that, that piece, those sort of funny little, you know, kids sort of stories, but in terms of training, um, what it did was it taught me the, the body training. Um, so it wasn't until much later on in my training that I started to ask questions. Why, you know, why you did things, how you did things, how your body worked, you know, and at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you just didn't have the ability or the, the, the sort of, yeah, the ability to ask those questions. So you just did. And so it was really useful to learn to to learn the body part of karate. Some of the mechanics were wrong, you know. I look back now, and but it was really interesting to learn, you know, and learning how to just train hard and not be afraid of that. And I think those pieces were ingrained in me, training wise. Um, but I think for the actual question, the quality of the training, you know, what what you do now, you know, starting much later, you would have gotten a, a far better quality of training, I think, rather than just the the slugging away. Um, you know, and I've been very lucky that, you know, I haven't had any injuries or things like that that have come out because of it. It's always interesting to me to hear how people start in such different ways, such varied ways, whether it be different age, different style. And we all seem to end up having such similar experiences. I, I think this analogy has been shared on the show before, and it, it certainly not something I made up, but it's on my mind because I was talking to someone just the other day and using it. As martial artists, we start all around the base of a mountain. And the further you go, the closer you get to the top and the closer you get to each other. Yeah, no, I agree. It, it's so funny. Um, you know, when you when you move away, you know, I'm, I'm a traditional Shotokan person. Um, I've had the good fortune to train with some just amazing people in other styles. Um, you know, I met General Che from the founder of Taekwondo, for example. I met Remy Prisaz, you know, um, at one point for Filipino stick fighting, you know, things like that. But at the end of the day, what you realize is that we, no matter what martial art or no, no matter what art you do, they're all the same. You know, that the human body and the mechanics of the human body is all the same. And I think that's just amazing to me. And, you know, again, I started traditional karate, kind of got away from it for a little while, came back to it. And, uh, it just gave you that broader view that teaches you exactly that, you know, that, that we all, you know, want to quest the same way. It's the, it's the quality of the training that really matters. It doesn't matter what style. Tell me about that time that you stepped away from being traditional. Yeah. So, um, I went to, um, I ended up going to a boarding school when I was about 13 
And uh, my parents just thought, you know, the the high school or where I grew up was actually a fairly rough area of, of Rotorua. And um, so they sh- they sort of moved me off to boarding school to to sort of you know with the idea of the education thing. And um, what what the, what was there at the time is they didn't have any martial arts whatsoever that was offered at the school. So I um, for th- the age of thirteen and fourteen, what I did was I trained by myself every single day. And so I was given the gym to myself, which was really lucky. And I would train for thirty minutes to an hour every day just by myself. And um, during that time, they actually started a taekwondo club there. And, uh, what happened was at the end of those two years, you know, I'm sort of hitting 14. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't just train by myself all the time. You know, it was, your training was kind of being stagnant. And so I, my parents, you know, in consultation with them and my instructors back home, it was like, well, let's just join this TKD club and, and see how it goes. And, uh, so I went into that and, you know, it was really neat. You know, you had to start from the beginning again, you know, starting at a white belt, which was fine. And, um, as you kind of move through, it was really interesting to me, you know, things like um, side thrust kick, for example, the way the TKD people do it completely and utterly changed the way that I was taught to do it in karate. And even though I teach, um, you know, traditional Shotokan karate, the way I teach side kick, you know, Yoko Kikome is exactly the same way that TKD people teach it. And I think that's really important because I think generally I find most instructors have trouble teaching the kicks correctly. You know, it's, it's really interesting that way. So it really broadened my views, um, and understanding that, you know, within TKD, there are problems within Shotokan, there are problems, but finding the correct way, um, it really helped me do that. Uh, training in Filipino stick fighting, understanding that close and feel the way that you control your elbows in stick fighting is just as amazing, you know, and that is brought directly to the way that you hold kama or, or your ready positions when you're fighting, in Kumite, you know, things like that. And it was interesting, the bits and pieces that broaden your view when you train these non-traditional styles. Um, the use of the center line in Wing Chun is just amazing, you know, the way that they do it. And for, um, I think for Shulakan stylists, I think it's really important that you don't just jump out and, you know, train in a million different styles and become, you know, a mile wide and an inch deep. You've got to go very, very deep. But when you look at traditional styles, they are very deep. And, um, you know, one of my, it's one of my pet peeves where people hear, you know, oh, you do Shotokan, it's just Shotokan. And the people who, you know, know this, they're like, I'm an expert in this. And they tell me what Shotokan's about and they tell me what it has and what it doesn't have. But my view on it after training it for, for so long is really, it's all there. You just, most people don't look deep enough. And, you know, it's, it took me to look through the lens of these other styles to understand exactly what Shotokan had to offer and where it was hidden. Because it's all there, you just have to look. And I think that's something that people really, you know, need to do, you know, over the long term. Hmm. I, I would completely agree. One of the things I find myself sharing or, or, or even telling myself as I consider my training and how I'm training and why I'm training of late is that a, a diverse martial artist is a better martial artist. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's got to be... Um, it's got to be diverse in terms of your thinking. Um, I don't, as I say, the thing that you've got to watch is this, these ideas of, you know, training in everything, but not being, you know, being a jack of all trades and master of none. You know, you've definitely got to focus and understand what your training is, whether it's Tang Soo Do, Taekwondo, Shotokan Karate, Gojiru, um, Wing Chun, it doesn't matter what, but you've got to apply that. And I think, you know, uh, Bruce Lee's idea of Jeet Kune Do, you know, the idea of, you know, cast, figuring out what works for your body, the thing is, when you look at Bruce Lee, when he was training and when he was moving, he was a Wing Chun boy. It was really clear. You look at any of his movies, it's clear what his base style was. But what he did that was clever is he surveyed the other martial arts to figure out what things worked for him. And looking, and he always looked at it through the lens of a, um, in my opinion, he always looked at it through the lens of a, of a, um, a Wing Chun person. And I think we have to do that with all of our arts. You know, you can't just go out after a year of training in one style and then go into another. You've got to look at it through the lens of whatever your art is and, and expand and build from there. And I think that's really important. You know, I still, you know, it's for me, I'll never regard myself as anything but a Shotokan guy. Yeah, I've trained in other styles and some of them for long periods of time, you know, Taekwondo, eight years. Um, but I'm still a Shotokan person. Everything I do is Shotokan. But the neat part is you can go train with Ishinru or Taekwondo or whatever. And because I understand my body and how it moves, 
I can sort of blend in with any of those other styles. And it's really fun to do that. I can certainly re relate to that. I, I have often been accused of karateing up my taekwondo forms. <laughs> <laughs> Same. You told us some stories there. You, you, you wandered around a little bit. We, we heard about the racetrack. We heard about some bits. Yeah. I know you've got a lot more. No one trains as long as you have and, and in multiple continents without having some great stories. So I'd like you to take a minute, tell us your best martial arts story. Yeah, so it's funny. Out of all of the, the questions that you sort of gave me beforehand to you know, sort of check out, um, this was the one I struggled with the most, um, funnily enough. And, you know, it's funny to me. You know, I look at things and, you know, I've had the good fortune over my training to train with some really big names. You know, Inouye Sensei before he passed away, Okazaki Sensei Senior, you know, uh, Kanazawa Sensei. You know, I was in Australia and happened to hang out with Kanazawa Sensei and was, we went to a cook your own food place. And I was next thing I look over and I'm cooking Kanazawa sensei steak, you know, and, you know, got to ask him, you know, sensei, is there ever time that you don't want to put your gear on and train? He just looks at me and goes, yeah. And I thought, cool, if that's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. You know, um, the, I could talk about, you know, when I was young, you know, going around, running around the blue lake in, in New Zealand, it's a six kilometer run. And, uh, my parents driving off without my, sh with my shoes and having to do it in bare feet. Um, I could talk about my Godan exam where I I got called up to fight a very famous uh, Shotokan instructor who was sitting his seventh dan. Um, I was sitting my fifth. And uh, he was on the 1973 team, but he had just had a liver transplant. And it's like, how do you even deal with doing kumite with, with a person like that? Um, and, you know, even more so, um, one, something, it's, it's something I like to sort of say out there is um, I was diagnosed with cancer about 12 years ago. But even when I was going through radiotherapy, I still showed up at the dojo and taught class. It was something hard and it was something that was really important to me to do. And I think, you know, showing that resilience in your spirit was really important. But it's funny. My best martial arts story out of, out of all of these things is just training with my club. It's training with them every day and seeing these people that come in, you know, and with, within collegiate clubs, you get this very limited window of like four years that you get to work with students. Yeah, you know, some of them, you're very fortunate, you get them longer. But generally, it's four years. And you see this progression in these humans from they come in as these 18 year olds that are sort of, you know, quite often never trained before. And they're just wide eyed. And, you know, some of them, you know, you go make aguke, make rising block. And it's just, you know, their arms flail about, you know, <laughs> you're like, ah, but you see them progress um, in terms of both physically and just mentally. And you see them walk out the door at the end of four years and um, they're transformed. And, you know, some of them have gone on uh, to go onto the U S national team. You know, some of them have made the East coast team. Um, some of them, you know, they're, they're doctors and da, da, da. And, you know, it's nice to think, you know, my best martial arts story is a story through them. It's the story that they've moved on and they've had the opportunities to, that they would have never otherwise gotten. Um, a good example of this, one of my students at Penn State, he would have been 350 pounds when he joined. And um, he trained with me for about a year or two years, I think, in the end. And um, he was an ex-cancer patient uh, when he was a kid. And um, anyway, halfway through, about six months into the training, he sort of holds up his pants and he puts them on, he holds them out, you know, and there's this massive gap, you know, and he goes, see this, see all this weight I've lost? He's go, it's your fault. And seeing that and this this student you know that would have never had the opportunity to represent his university he represented penn state at collegiate tournaments he would have never had those kinds of opportunities um if it hadn't have been for karate and so you know it, it's stories like that that i i think about uh, are by far and away my favorite martial arts stories it's it's the fact that you have this very small window of time to really make an impact on people's lives and something that's so allegorical to, to why they're actually at university. You know, they're at college to, to learn within their disciplines and arts, but they get to do this other thing and it becomes really meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, yeah, that, that's by far my, my favorite thing, you know, hands down. You fill a dual role, you know, in, in university. You're, you're teaching academic classes and you're teaching martial arts. Mm -hmm. How does your experience as an academic instructor impact your martial arts instruction and vice versa? Well, uh, yeah, funny, it's the vice versa one's the most interesting. I can tell you for a fact, the only reason I ever got a job or the only reason I'm actually able to teach well 
is because of karate. Um, I remember when I was a, a, a student in college, I used to be so shy. It'd be like, I don't want to have to fill up the car with gas because I'm going to, you know, have to interact with someone. You know, it was that kind of thing. And then, you know, you stick white pajamas on me and I'm running around like an idiot in front of a class. It, it taught me that confidence. And so what that did was that impacted. And just the way I teach, I teach by allegories all the time. I always teach by um, allegories and analogies all the time. You know, I always, you know, this is like this, this is like that. and I teach biology the same way. Um, the, the classes I teach at university are things like kinesiology, developmental biology, um, genetics. You know, those are sort of my wheelhouse. And the lessons that I've learned on the dojo floor to be able to teach somebody how to physically move their body. You know, when you think about it, it's like saying, you know, describe the color orange. You know, describe Gyakuzuki. You know, um, techniques in karate are not named. Like in, in my mind, um, when I think of Gyakuzuki or reverse punch, it's not the finished product. It's not that finished shape. It's rather how you get there. And so, you know, just the way that you think about how to teach somebody how to physically move their hand from their hip out to make that punch um, is really hard. And it takes a lot of thought. And I put the same amount of thought into my college classes. You know, when you're sitting there and you're talking about DNA transcription or RNAi and trying to describe how that works and why it's important and why you should do that, that becomes important. Same thing when you're talking in karate, you know, why does your front foot have to be forward in forward stance? Why should the back foot be turned around? You know, why, what are the, how's the musculature work to do that? That becomes important. And so that dual role in terms of just the way I approach pedagogy in general is the same to me. It's the same whether I'm teaching genetics or if I'm teaching hand short arm. It, it doesn't really, doesn't really differentiate out in my mind. I've had the opportunity to teach a number of of things, you know, usually technical stuff back from my IT days. And in every instance, I was followed back on my experience teaching martial arts. Oh, a absolutely. And, you know, the, the thing, you know, it's funny, you know, I've been teaching um, college classes for a little over 10 years now, and I still get butterflies in my stomach. You know, when I walk into that class for the first day, it's like, oh, you know, they're going to hate me. Is it going to be? And, uh, you know, it's really embarrassing to admit that, I guess, now. Everyone's going to know I'm a wiener. That's okay. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, you still get those butterflies. But at the end of the day, as soon as you get in, you, you've got this confidence in what you know. And, you know, just going up there and enjoying being in front of them is is so huge, you know. And it's the same – again, karate's the same way. When I'm out there teaching, seeing these light bulbs go off or getting people to to move a certain way or getting them to do something, and you see their – karate from, you know, sort of the beginning of class to the end of class and one small minuscule point is better. And then you've done your job. You know, Yaguchi sensei always says, um, step by step, you know, just, just make these baby steps. And, and that's so true, whether it's again, genetics development, karate doesn't matter. You know, absolutely. Outside of teaching in academia and, and martial arts, are there any other hobbies? Is, is there anything else that you're passionate about? Yeah. So um, I, I'm a science nerd, of course. You know, I've got my buck teeth, you know, glasses and a, a lab coat with a pocket, pocket protector. Um, I have an active research lab. So we, uh, we actually work on understanding um, how natural fruit compounds um, can actually combat stomach cancer. And so we grow cancer cells in the lab and we treat them with these compounds and we pull out the RNA and we look at, you know, what the cells are doing. And um, we do that. We work on some algal blooms. So understanding how environmental effects sort of um, control algal blooms uh, here in Rhode Island and in, in the Narragansett Bay. And so those are really fun. And, you know, again, I have a really active group of students that work with me doing that. It's really fun. Uh, I surf and sup, you know, out, out in the ocean. It's, you know, I'm a New Zealander, you know, you, you got to enjoy these <laughs> things. Um, so I'll do that really badly, mind you. Um, but, you know, I really enjoy uh, spending time, you know, other than sort of biology, teaching, karate. Um, the other thing, of course, is spending time with my family. You know, um, we, I have a three-year-old, Mr. Human, um, and also the, the, the boss, my wife. Um, so hang out with them. We have two dogs, one sort of a weird half schnauzer, half dashing and a, a mad labradoodle. And so, you know, just hang out with them and, and doing stuff with them. You know, I love to travel, you know, those kinds of things. I think that's really important. You know, um, I'm still trying to talk Mr. Human into, you know, he's only three. Um, but you know, one of the big conundrums of course is when's he going to do karate, you know? And at the moment he's always, whenever people come over to train, um, He'll be, oh, hi, ah, you know, the hi, ah, girl's coming, uh, you know, this kind of thing. Um, 
you know, he'll probably grow up and hate it. But, you know, my, my goal is, is, you know, when he's ready, he'll start. Um, I'm in no hurry for him too, obviously. Um, and I think what I'm going to do, um, Scott Langley coined this uh, a little while ago, that he heard that, you know, when people should start training is when they can dress for karate. And so, you know, I think I'm going to use that as my gauge. But, mm. you know, he's I'm never going to force him into it until he starts dating and then he has to be a black belt. <laughs> but other than that, he'll be, he'll be in good shape. Now, I'm curious because this is always a, an interesting subject for me as someone who does not have children to look at someone who is a martial arts instructor and has children. Mm -hmm. Will he train under you or will you send him to someone else? Um, <laughs> I, it's funny. I'm struggling with that right now. And, you know, I wonder, is it worthwhile, you know, sending him down to, you know, one of the dojos and, you know, gasp actually paying for, for karate, you know, um, it's, you know, cause there are some, you know, I don't want him to go like the, the way my approach to karate is, you know, I teach 18 year olds, you know, and it's, um, you know, putting a child into that is very similar to what I went through. And I don't know, you know, maturity wise, if he'll be able to handle that, you know, yeah, he's growing up around it. Um, eventually I'll train with him, um, and get him, you know, to where he needs to go. Um, but, you know, I always wonder, you know, should he be introduced to it through, you know, a lot of these these dojos that really cater and do a really good job catering to younger children? Yeah, I know I couldn't do it, you know, but I see others, you know, going and doing it. And, you know, if there are things that I don't agree with technique wise, you know, I can fix that later. Um, but, yeah, it's one of those things I've really struggled with, funnily enough. It's such a paradox because you've got on the one hand the the recognition that your teaching style is not necessarily appropriate for someone who's younger. Yeah, yeah. But on the other side, I mean, when, when you talk about traditional martial arts, I mean, who was it handed down from and to back in the day? It, it was a familial thing. That's, that's right. So to yeah. have, to have that conflict is what I find very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in my brain, the way I've kind of, I guess sort of flipped it out is that, you know, he'll start out maybe somewhere else and then, you know, eventually come back to me, you know, when he's sort of older, you know, especially, you know, I think that, you know, he'll dress when he's ready. Uh, you know, when he can dress himself, he'll be ready to, to sort of train. But it's, you know, I'm sort of weighing up those things. Um, I have some uh, other instructors that train with me, you know, who who run, who I trust, you know, who I'm who are like considering, you know, in a few years thing about children's classes. But it's really, you know, I think a specialized children's class is definitely the way to go initially and especially while they're young, you know, when he's older and can mentally handle the way I teach um, because it's very information driven. You know, I'm a scientist. Um, then I think he'll be ready, you know, but it's, he's got to wait until then, you know, and the nice thing is I have kind of a gauge because I went through it as a child. So, you know, I, I re very much remember, you know, it was, wasn't until I was 11, 12, 13 that karate really started clicking with me in terms of understanding what you were doing, you know. We heard you hint at something, so I'm not sure if that's where you're going to go with this next one, but I'd like you to tell us about a time in your life that was difficult, challenging. Yeah, and how um, your your martial arts, you know, was able to help you get through. Yeah, there's there's been a number. Um, funnily enough, you know, I sort of yeah, I brought up the cancer one before, um, and that was tough. And karate really, and I'm going to sort of pull out three examples, three major turning points. I think, um, and they're very personal to me. Um, one of them was, of course, cancer. You know, I was diagnosed, and they go, you know, <laughs> nothing kind of freaks you out when you go and have your appendix out, and they, you know, the doctor runs out of the room screaming, thinking he's looking at a dead man. Um, <laughs> good thing there was lots of morphine in my veins at the time. I'm like, oh, okay, that's nice. Um, but uh, it, it it was interesting because I think martial arts teaches you never to give up, um, and it teaches you to just keep going. Uh, when I was going through radiotherapy, I was asked to go down to our fall camp. Okazaki sensei asked me to be there for the collegiate meeting. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, as long as I get to, you know, do a training. So I did a training full blown with, you know, 150 other people in the room. Uh, and I remember sensei Riley was teaching it and just, you know, I, I went halfway through and I'm like, Oh my goodness, I'm gassed. I'm like done. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and next thing, um, you know, I just kept doing it as much as I could, you know, and I remember Okazaki sensei, you know, in the meeting actually coming up and coming over to me, which was very rare for a, a Japanese senior instructor like that and asking how I was. Um, but it never entered my mind that I was going to die. It was like, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep doing this. The radiotherapy, big deal. You know, you just muscle through it. And so karate teaches you that. The second time was um, 
when I was doing my PhD thesis and I remember I'm typing up, you know, I'm on chapter number four or five or whatever, you know, and I'm 20 pages in and then I do the stupid like save over my original file mm. and poof, that chapter's gone. And, you know, I'm just about ready to pick up my computer and throw it out the window. You know, I'm, like, I'm done. Screw it. Ah, no more thesis. You know, I don't need this PhD thing. You know, and then I remembered, well, wait a minute. It took me 16 years to figure out how to do a stepping punch. So this PhD thing, real easy. And so what I found was karate always, has always been um, my benchmark. It's always been the thing in my life where I, can, where I realize that, well, any time a challenge has come up in my life, um, I've realized that karate has been something that's always been there. It's been this constant that's not easy. And if you can muscle through that, and I've muscled through it in karate, then any other challenge that life gives me, I've got something larger that I've been plugging away at, if that makes sense. And and so I think that's, you know, and whether it was cancer, whether it was my PhD thesis, um, I think that's really important. Um, what I have found at depressing points in my life um, for example, my father passed away in my second year of my PhD program over here. And, you know, there's nothing like, you know, a, a parent, um, disappearing away on you when you're, you know, sort of 14,000 miles away. And, um, what I realized very quickly was that I started delving too deep into karate. You know, I, it became sort of a crutch. Um, so I started to neglect other things in my life. And I think that's a really important point just to bring up that you've always got to keep your karate and balance with the rest of your life. You know, everything about what you do should be kept in balance. And, um, you know, I found for that brief period of time, it was about six months or so, you know, karate really took over and it was what I needed at the time, but it wasn't healthy either. You know, just like, you know, not doing any karate, you know, I think you can go too far the other way as well. And so, you know, I think all of those things sort of tying together really point out that karate was always this benchmark but it was very important to not let it take over, if that makes sense. It does. It does. And I thank you for sharing that. Certainly uh, circumstances that, you know, at least in part, many of us have experienced. I mean, I've certainly lost things that I've worked on and wanted to throw computers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're very good at that, aren't they? <laughs> they are. They are. And, uh, you know, not that this has anything to do with, with martial arts, but just business-wise now, on my primary computer, there is an external drive that I run once a week. So uh -huh. if it gets infected, it can't spread. And, and I've got three different layers of backup running continuously because <laughs> I have lost some very important things over the years. And uh, longer term listeners will, will remember my career prior, you know, in IT, I, I ran a consulting firm for a number of years and saw so much of this that I've just become so paranoid of it in oh. my own life. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I have, uh, yeah, a Mac and just, you know, just the fact that it has that automatic backup, you know, that I've got to a, an outside hard drive is just huge to me. You know, I have like three of them that I plug in, you know, one at home, one here, yeah. you know, <laughs> just in case. Yeah. It's good stuff. It, we, we are in a good place now with the cloud if it is used oh, yeah. properly. You've dropped some pretty big names mm -hmm. earlier, people that you've mm -hmm. been fortunate enough to train with or, or at least meet. Yeah. If we were to take out that, that first instructor... Because uh -huh. I, I think for most of us, that's the person that really sets our direction. But other yeah. than them, mm -hmm. who would you say is the person that's been the most influential in your martial arts? So it's, it's funny. Um, I think people come along in your martial arts career at particular times. And um, yeah, you know, I've been, I've been very fortunate to be taken sort of under the wing of, of some of people, you know, throughout my career. Um, you know, Okazaki Sensei, Robin Riley, um, who's just been amazing to me um, over the last couple of years. But um, I think as you go through, I've, I've always seen particular turning points, if this makes sense, in your karate career. So one guy who um, just amazes me, um, he lives in a little town in New Zealand called Koato. And it's a really interesting place, you know, if you want to want to check it out. But um, he was running the karate. I was there for an internship and um, he was running the karate dojo there. And, um, he was, he was a guy who never, he never graduated high school. You know, he had a job that, that paid well, but was very sort of monotonous. Um, but what he did was he was the first person that made me ask the question why in karate. And it's just one of those things that's really important. I don't think, you know, I, I think always believe there's a difference between education and intelligence. And, um, Nick, 
was one of those guys who was incredibly intelligent. He didn't have the education, but man, he had the intelligence. And what he did was he had me going, well, why do you have the back leg straight in, Zing in forward stance? Why do you have, why is the back leg bent? What's the point of this? And it just blew my mind. You know, I'm like 20 years old and I'm pff, gone, you know, <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. A third year in college. And he started me down the path of which I never looked back. And so, you know, he really showed me that piece. You know, the, the next person who came along a couple of years later was um, a, a, an instructor called Goran Glucina um, out of New Zealand as well. And he had trained in Japan, did the Japanese instructor training course, and he showed me what real Shotokan traditional karate was. You know, like if you had told me that I would ever meet Kanazawa sensei or, you know, train with people of that caliber, I would have laughed in your face for the 16 years before that. And I remember that the first training I had with him was, you know, I'd step forward into forward stance because, no, you're doing it wrong. Hey, you, you're doing this wrong. Hey, you, you're doing that wrong. And this after 16 years of training, I thought I was pretty hot. And uh, I remember going home at the end of that training and I just burst into tears. You know, I started this, this you know, 23, 24-year-old just burst into tears. I'm like, oh my goodness, I've wasted the last 16 years. I hadn't. But it showed me that there was so much further to go. Um, training with a guy um, very recently after about 35 years of training, um, I started training with with a guy out here in, um, in the States, um, Steve Ubel, who just absolutely showed me that there's, that karate didn't have to be fancy. It, it's, it's kihon, it's straight basics, but showed me that there's this whole new level of basics and basic training that that you can do and apply to your karate, how the principles of these things can be applied to everything. Um, and really, so what you find is there's these people that come along, you know, karate seems to, you train, 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 and then your skills kind of plateau. And then you meet someone who just profoundly changes it. And then boom, you shoot up in terms of your thinking, you know, and, and move along. And then they plateau again. Then you meet somebody else and it, it continues on that upward arc, which is just amazing. And then you have constant people who are there correcting you, you know, um, Okazaki sensei, Riley sensei, you know, who, who are constantly picking on you, you know, but, but seeing these people, you know, who, who are still training is just inspiring to me. You know, they, they blow me away every single day, you know, that, and I'm always amazed that they, they spend time with me, you know, and Hey JD, you're doing this wrong. Hey JD, you're doing that wrong. You know, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, just, just phenomenal to me. You know, I'm always thankful about that. I want to go back to something that you, you spoke on very briefly because it's, it's something that I'm still starting to hear come through in more and more conversations on this show. Mm -hmm. But it's something that prior to this show, I'd never heard anyone talk about. It's that moment where you step back and you question if you have wasted all of your training, that moment that brought you to tears, the, the same moment I had last year that brought me to tears. And I've talked to a few others. We've had one or two more on the show volunteer that. Would you be yeah. willing to talk about that for a moment? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and this is the funny thing, you know, you can get into trouble for, you know, as I say, I'm not, and when I talk about this, you know, I just want to be clear, I'm in no way bashing any other style or system or anything like that. But what you find is that there are dogmas that have been introduced and, you know, and, and Shotokan as well, and, and very, 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 or in a lot of different martial arts styles, you know, um, where they're just wrong. And, you know, the, the way that we that I was originally taught to do Yokogiri Kyage, a side snap kick, for example, was you simply lifted the leg um, up and then it was the knee that rotated out on exactly the wrong angle that mechanically it, it does that. And this is how you were taught. And the reason it was taught that way is because um, the instructor that, you know, whoever the head of the system is or the sensei was never taught to do it properly. And chances are their instructor was never to do it properly and, and so forth as you work back. And so it's not anyone's fault. It was just never taught. And, you know, all things have been handed down, you know, things like the back leg and forward stance, you know, it should be locked. And it's like, well, no, it shouldn't be locked because that raises the rear hip up, you know, and pushes your bum out. It should be straight, but not locked. You know, there's a difference. And, the things that I think my, my gut feeling sort of says they were things that were lost in translation from Japanese to English, mm. and then they were taken as dogma from there. And so what happens when you end up under somebody with these critical eyes who are just phenomenal or amazing, they can see that. And so you realize that you've been trained and, you know, depending on how sort of detached you were from these sort of these mainstream, you know, very, you know, traditional or, um, nah, it's not the word, these more, um, 
these styles that are closer to the source, let me put it that way, um, what you find is that other things start to creep in more and more often of, of these sort of these weird dogmas, these weird sort of ticks, if you like, that are not necessarily mechanically correct. Um, you know, something that always interested me when I started, you know, I was, I grew up in one organization under Kanazawa sensei, you know, that's, that's who, um, Glucina sensei was, was affiliated with. And yeah, that was, he really changed me. When I came to America, um, I started training with the ISKF under Okazaki sensei, you know, he was only three hours away in Philadelphia. And, um, what I noticed was I did things that were different to traditional ISKF training. You know, just my approach was very different because that was how I learned. And I had ta a Taekwondo background and, you know, karate background extending all the way back. But what I noticed was Okazaki sensei, you know, would never correct me in these, these things because they were mechanically correct. And when you look across the different, the different senior instructors, if you look at Oshi sensei, Okazaki sensei, Kanazawa sensei, Anoida sensei, Yaguchi sensei, they all do karate slightly differently and it's to their body type. And so I think karate is a lot looser than what we make it. It's got to be built on solid fundamentals, but those fundamentals come from mechanics. So what I think happens is over time, I think people train under a single instructor and they develop that single lens. And so there are things that either the instructor doesn't do because their body doesn't do it, or they're trying to fix everybody else. So they overemphasize one particular point. I call that a training aid. Um, or they go in and um, really sort of, you know, teach those kinds, you know, the, they teach that and the students become indoctrinated that that's quote unquote the way. And it may not be. It's sometimes you teach a mistake, a wrong way to do something to fix other things. But sometimes they can get ingrained in people. And I think people, every karateka needs to ask the question, why? Why is it done this way? If you're training with an instructor and, you know, you go up to them after class, you say, well, why, why do you do it this way? And if they can't come up with an answer, then, well, you know, you've got to query it. You've got to question it. And I think that's really healthy and, and vital. And even things with um, Sensei Glucina, you know, we would have discussions and there are things that I don't agree with them. You know, there are things that all, almost all of my instructors I don't agree with, but I, I want to listen and understand why they do it that way. You know, most of the time the good instructors have a reason, but if they don't, then you've got to question why it's there in the first place. And so these kinds of, um, this is what I learned to do by, you know, so I don't think any training's wasted. You know, this is, this is sort of how I've reconciled it in my head, but rather I think, when you just are in one type of training and you accept it as a dogma, that becomes wasted training because it's, you're not being critical of yourself. You're not working to make your karate better. You're just doing what you're told. You know, there's a point where you have to do what you're told, but eventually you've got to make it your own and, and understand why and how you're doing it. And that's important. Mm. And this kind of ties back to one of the very earliest points that you made as we were talking about training in, in different things and, the benefit there, but it also supports your your comment that you have to go deep enough with it. You know, yeah, there, there, there are so many instances where someone will see something on the internet or, or hear something or go to a weekend seminar and allow that to completely unsettle everything that they have done when yeah. they haven't necessarily gone deep enough to see that, you know, to, to borrow back to the, the mountain analogy things are far closer as you get into it yeah. than they may seem. No, that, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of trends, you know, where you see things like in basic karate, I always get, everybody tells me knows more about Shotokan than I do, tells me, I'm being sarcastic there, sorry. Um, but, you know, they'll come <laughs> up to me and they'll say, well, you know, uh, in karate there's no circular techniques or there's no throwing techniques. And it's like, karate's full of them. Oh my goodness, are you not looking, you know, it's, but it's, it's just looking through the lens, you know, and so I find people, you know, actually going out and making businesses, teaching, you know, different principles or teaching things as separate or that it's something particularly new and it isn't, it's just looking at it through a, through the lens, you know, everything's one of the things that I like about traditional for me, Shotokan Karate, but you see the same in Goju, you know, any of the, the mainstream, deep, solid, you know, um, martial arts, they have everything. They're all there. It's just you've you've just got to look deep, and it may take training in something else to see it, you know. And but it's always been there, you know. If you look at those movements and analyze those movements, and really, you know, look at bunkai that that analysis of what you do, it's all there. And and furthermore, the part that's really freaky about it 
is, you know, you might be, you know, if you look at somebody who's bigger, then grappling applications works for them. Um, you know, I always joke and sound fat, but I'm not really. I like punching people. That's what I'm good at. And um, for me, or I look at a 120-pound girl, you know, that trains with me, there's no way she'd be able to grapple or wrestle with with a 200-pound, 300-pound guy. You know, she has to strike him in the squidgy bits. And so, but those are all in karate. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're a grappler or a, a striker or whatever. It's all there. You just got to look for it. Mm. When we think about your history, your deep history, your broad history of training and, and the people you've been able to work under, mm -hmm. are there are there names that are missing? Is there someone that you'd love to either roll back time or travel around to work out with? So it's kind of funny. Um, I've been very, very fortunate and I've gotten to train with a lot of the, the Shotokan greats and, and other styles. You know, I've, I've managed to train with Hiragona um, out of um, Gojiru, you know, as I've mentioned. You know, so, so I've managed to get a lot of these. But the thing that I'm most jealous of, and it's really funny, um, with some of my conversations with Sensei Riley, um, I'm always kind of jealous of him because he, when I met Okazaki Sensei or... Um, Kanazawa sensei or, you know, these guys or Yaguchi sensei, they were all old men. You know, by the time I got to train with them, I never got to train with Nakayama sensei. That's one of my regrets. You know, he passed away in 1987. Um, there was no way, you know, I would have gotten the opportunity to train with him. But what I really wish is I wish that I had had the opportunity to train with some of those guys when they were younger, when they were in their 40s, you know, when their karate was peaking. You know, that's, that's what I've really liked. And that's not to take away anything from Okazaki Sensei. You know, every time I trained with him, you know, he'd do the first move out of hand shot on, and you'd just see his hip kind of flop and his leg would go out and he'd just be down. And you're like, my brain couldn't never quite put it together. And this was a man in his 80s. Um, or he'd, you know, talk about, oh, you know, we can do floor training day. And he'd lie down. Then he'd just put his feet and stand up. But then you, and you'd go, well, big deal. But then you realize he's in his 80s. You know, I have trouble doing that at my age. And, uh, but to see them in their prime, I think, would have been one of those amazing things. Um, oh, there's one other person I really want to train with, Chuck Norris. Absolutely. <laughs> who wouldn't, right? Right. You know, he's just, um, I think he would, he'd, he's one of those guys who I think would be just really fun to train with. Um, I did get to train with Bill Superfoot Wallace. Never been kicked in the face so many times by a 70-year-old before. Um, but, yeah, Chuck Norris is, is definitely on my list. Mm. Now, I wouldn't ask this follow-up of everyone. Mm-hmm. Some of the people listening, whether you're, you're a Shotokan karate practitioner or not, may, may be wondering, there was a name that, that's sort of absent from that list, mm -hmm. but everything that you say has been so intentional that I'm guessing there's a reason, you know, these kind of second to third generation Shotokan uh -huh. practitioners, you know, why, why, are, why are you honing in on them? So to me... You know, growing up in New Zealand, I think it was, for me personally, it was always so far out of my reach to ever train with any of these guys. Like, if you had have asked me, as, you know, I remember with, with Nick, you know, the guy that made me think about karate, I remember sitting there and we were watching a video of, um, of Yahara Sensei doing Unsu, the kata Unsu. And it just blew me away. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'd never seen anything like it. You know, years later, I got to train with him once. Um, I think... For me, they were so far out of my reach that I still can't believe that I get the that I've had the privilege to train with them now. And um, I think they really, you know, because uh, uh, one of the names that's missing off my list is Finokoshi Sensei, and it's kind of purposeful. Um, at the end of the day, he had his way of doing things. I think his words, you know, and and Karate Do My Way of Life, and that really resonate. You know, I, I think they're huge. But training with some of these the the sort of second and third generation people you're seeing where it became and when, where and how it was interpreted by different people. You know, karate was interpreted by different people because we all have different body types. And seeing that manifestation in those different people, I think is huge, if that makes sense. You know, rather than, you know, everyone's always, I want to train with Finokoshi. Well, he had one body type and he was sort of like, you know, the central figure. But, but look at the way that these different amazing people train. And they're all different. And why are they different? And why have they chosen that way to train? And why have they got developed these signature styles and this branching? You know, because it's all it's all Shotokan. You know, it's all oranges, or it's all apples. It's just some of them are Macintosh apples, some of them are, are Pacific Rose, some of them are, are you know Red Delicious, and so forth. And it's to me that just blows me away. And it would have been amazing to see them. You know, not to mention they can't do it now, but 
it would have been amazing to see them when they were younger, you know, in the 60s and then, you know, even through into the, the sort of early 80s. So often, whether it's in business or, you know, in personality types, we see that there are those that are good at originating things, creating, mm -hmm. being first movers. Yeah. But it is, I don't know if I want to say uncommon, but certainly there is a lot of room for others to come in, take what they've created and make it dramatically better. C correct. And, you, you know, two examples that pop straight into my mind um, is Asai Sensei and Kanazawa Sensei. You know, um, in some ways, you know, them leaving the JK was, was one of the best things that happened to them because it gave them the freedom to really explore what they found interesting. You know, and the karate that they produced out of that, you know, having that solid base, but the karate that they produced afterwards was just superb, you know, as a result. You know, so they had that, those years and years and years of hard, basic, solid training. But where they went to, given that freedom, is just phenomenal. For sure. Let's talk about competition. Okay. Has competition been part of your training? Yeah, it, it has. When I was younger, um, I, I, you know, I used to tr uh, compete in New Zealand. Um, I've done, a, done it maybe twice in the United States, um, once at an East Coast tournament. We, basically, they needed a third man for a kata team you know, at, at the university. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. That'll be fun. Um, <laughs> But really, I made a decision when I came, and I was on in New Zealand. I was on the New Zealand team. I got to beat up Australians, so that was fun. Um, but really, the when I came to the United States and I started uh, the Shotokan Club at Penn State, um, I had to make a decision, and that was either to train myself or train my team. And that's what I decided to do. I trained my team instead of me. And my karate got better because they got better, obviously, but I was never in a position where I felt comfortable competing anymore. You know, that, that kind of piece happened and it, it became part of my, um, part of my mantra was to make my students as good as I could possibly get them. And, you know, again, that, that showed it, you know, that the, the, I think back across my collegiate clubs and the number of times, you know, they've won U S nationals for the ISKF, you know, was a mate they just blew me away with what they could produce. Um, so that was important to me, you know, they've, they've always done extremely well. And, um, and it's, it doesn't come from me. It just comes from me yelling at them and them doing the work. You know, they're amazing. Um, I think that being said, I do think competition is really important for a period of your life. Again, it, just within life, I think karate training has to be kept in balance. So, you know, the reason you want to do uh, tournaments, one th reason that I think is really important to do it, and same thing with testing. Testing and tournaments is the same thing. Is there a way to test your karate? That's simply a benchmark uh, mechanism where you can go in and, you know, you, your goal is, you know, whether you make it through one round or you win it, it doesn't matter in my, in my mind. I tell my students the same thing. What I want you to do is I want you to step up on the line and do karate. And if you're happy with how that comes out, you know, if you're happy and you've gone out there and you've laid it all out and your karate was superb in your mind, then your training is good. And it's the same thing with kumite. If you go out there and you fight and you compete and you feel the kumite happening and you, you do well, it doesn't matter what you get. It's it's that benchmark of how your karate is progressing to you. You know, that your training's personal. And tournaments provide that situation. You know, the other way we could do it is, you know, you could go out to, you know, drop you off in, in some dodgy area of town and, you know, slap you on the butt and go, okay, you know, we'll see you in a couple of hours, you know, but, you know, doing tests and tournaments allows you to, to put yourself into a high pressure situation and test to see if your karate works. And that's, that's their, their use. You know, I think that's important and it's important to develop that when you're young and, you know, also when you're older, you know, I think it's important to continually test for that, you know? Mm, for sure. You mentioned Chuck Norris earlier. Are you uh, a, are you a big Chuck Norris fan? Are you a big fan of his movies and Walker, Texas Ranger and all that? Yeah, so-so. I just think okay. he's cool. Um, you know, uh, the, you know, my favorite, um, my favorite movies, hands down, martial arts movies, is uh, Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon. If you haven't seen that, it is awesome. Um, you know, things where, you know, yeah. the characters and, you know, Bruce Leroy and, you know, the Shogun of Harlem. I mean, it, it's just awesome. And the, and the reason I like that kind of martial arts film is, is because it doesn't take itself seriously. Um, it laughs at itself. You know, the, the martial arts in it are really just fun to watch. You know, and the story behind it is really neat. Um, my favorite, I think, actor, um, hands down, is Jet Li. Mm. Um, 
this just hands down. And, you know, his, his historical stuff, you know, Fearless and Hero are just amazing stories. But, you know, the, the movie that always clicks in my head is Forbidden Kingdom. Um, I don't know if you've seen that, but it's, um, there's yeah. one line in it that I think is just spectacular. And, you know, in it, the main protagonist is sort of freaking out. He's got all these trials ahead of him. And he's just like, you know, he's thinking about what he has to do. And he, he ends up, you know, they end up in this sort of cave and Jet Li's just sort of sitting there very serene, just mellowing out. And, the, you know, the, the the protagonist walks up and he's just, he's weird out. And he's like, you know, what if I can't handle it? What if I freeze? And Jet Li, who's just sitting there so incredibly serenely, just turns and looks at him and goes, don't forget to breathe. And I think that to me just really resonates because, you know, I think just in general, we freak out in life. You know, we have these kinds of things happening and we forget to breathe sometimes. And the thing that it does to me, that puts into perspective all of karate training. Um, karate is a true microcosm of the world. The dojo is a true microcosm of the world. How many times have you stood across from someone like, oh my goodness, I'm so going to get my bottom smacked. You know, I'm so scared right now, you know, or you're going up to test, you know, and everything just kind of blanks out. You know, if you get up for your kata or, you know, you walk up and they go, you know, do this kata. And you're like, do what? Because you know, everything stops. <laughs> but but then you breathe and then you do it because the training takes over. And I think that happens in every day in your life, you know, as you train, the, the same things come out. Yeah. And so, you know, the, those kinds of things I think are just, just really neat. Um, I think Jackie Chan's just awesome. Um, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme, I mean, he was one of my big heroes, you know, growing up. Um, you know, the original Kickboxer and that, you know, I think they were great movies, you know. But um, but really, it's it's The Last Dragon, totally in the Forbidden Kingdom, uh, two of my favorites for, for those reasons. The Last Dragon's a, a great film, and it's one that actually doesn't come up on the show too often. And I would not be doing my job as host if I didn't remind potentially new listeners that we had – the star of that movie, Tama Gariello, on the show. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because this was the, or, or uh, last year was the 25th or 30th anniversary of the movie. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. he did a big media tour and, and, and they reached out to us. And uh, an absolute joy to talk to. I'll, I'll drop the link in the show notes for, for this episode. So if anybody's new, we do those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And you can see everything from today's episode, and we'll we'll link to Timex episode as well. Yeah, it was, it, it was a fun one. It was quite an honor to get to talk to him. Yeah, that would have been. I'm so jealous again. <laughs> <laughs> I I am a I am a very lucky man. I, yeah, I, okay. I have a microphone, and I get to talk to the world. It's fantastic. <laughs> How about books? You seem pretty passionate about about movies, and certainly about martial arts culture and history. Does that translate into your reading as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I heard there's this great book by this guy Swanson. That's it's out. Um, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, you know, really, you know, when you look at martial arts books, there's there's a lot out there, and I think there's some really neat ones. You know, um, you know, I can't go any further without talking about Nakayama's Best Karate. Um, you know, for me, those are the the go to books. You know, for kata and. You know, not not necessarily the applications, but just how to do the kata. You know, if there's something where I'm like, uh -huh, how's that hand held or things like that? Because, again, I think every kata was put together and has the hands in a particular place for a particular reason. Um, I'm starting to to look at some of the philosophy stuff. Um, Okazaki Sensei's book, uh, Perfection of Character, um, is really important. I'm actually starting to read, terrifyingly enough, a lot of neuroscience stuff. I'm in researching for, for, the, for my next book. Um, some so a couple that I think are really really useful that are out there is um, that some that were a little bit paradigm shifting for me was um, Little Black Book of Violence by Lawrence Kane and Chris Wilder and also Meditations on Violence by Rory Miller. Um, just really talking about the real world ideas and you know you always hear people I teach self defense classes and this and that you know if they've done it without reading those books man you know <laughs> there's a lot of things missing in in self defense and just your approach to self defense you know. Um, at the university here occasionally, you know, I'll, I'll be asked to talk about self-defense and it's no longer, oh, you walk up somebody and poke their eyes out. It's here's the pre stuff. Here's the post stuff. Here's verbal de-escalation. You know, all those good things that, that really came out. Um, and really, I think it was Ian Abernethy's podcast that really got me into those books initially. Um, and I love a lot of the autobiographies of, of some of these guys, you know, um, Yaguchi Sensei's Mind and Body Like Bullet, Bullet Kanazawa Sensei's Karate, My Way of Life, um, C.W. Nicole's Moving Zen, uh, Scott Langley's Karate Stupid, uh, Stan Schmidt's Way of the Empty Hand. They're really neat. And it's it's interesting to me to read them when you read ones that were, were written 
by Japanese instructors, Yuguchi and Kanazawa Sensei's book, and then comparing those to instructors that were in Japan in the 1960s, like C.W. Nicole and Stan Schmitz, and then comparing that with somebody who was there relatively recently, like Scott Langley, it's interesting to see the Japanese version of it. It's interesting to see the Westerner version in the 1960s, and then it's interesting to see the Westerner version you know, in the 2000s, and just how it's progressed and changed over time, and how some things haven't changed. And um, I think, you know, they're really interesting analyses from my perspective into the culture of karate, you know, um, ideas like what does senpai actually mean? What does kyohai actually mean? What does sensei actually mean? You know, those sorts of things. And I think they're really, really useful and healthy. Let's talk about the future. Yeah. Ooh, well, you're, you're, you wrote a book. We'll, we'll hear more about that in a second. Uh -huh. But you're still training. You're still teaching. You have a family. So clearly you've you've decided this is a priority. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is it about martial arts that that's, is keeping you going and is it going in, in pursuit of anything? So one of the things that terrifies me more than anything is um, I'm always worried that traditional karate is dying. And um, it, it scares me, almost, almost to the point of keeping me up at night. And... One of the, you know, it's interesting to me, you know, within the ISKF, um, it's been very interesting. Um, Okazaki Sensei recently retired. And, you know, now we have um, Hiroshi Okazaki Sensei, who's taken over with support of Robin Riley and the rest of the Shihankai and Technical Committee. And it's a really neat time to be in the ISKF and in the, in the organization um, because they're now, you know, they're, they're now questioning, you know, and they're moving forward and they're moving the organization forward. And it's, it's neat. Um, I was asked to to be director of the ECCKU, which is the East Coast Collegiate Karate Union, and the NCKA, the National Collegiate Karate Association, uh, just this last year. And um, so one of the things that, that concerns me about karate is, you know, if it is disappearing, one of the places that we can really build it is in collegiate karate. And, you know, these both these organizations, ECCKU and the NCKA, are, while are under the ISKF officially, um, and I report to Okazaki sensei, to Hiroshi sensei, um, any Shotokan based club can, as long as they're affiliated with the collegiate can be part of this. And so it's really neat to, to start to, to build that and build strategies, you know, because the way I look at, at a lot of this is that, you know, Shotokan itself is very, has been splintering over the years. You know, there was the, the split between, um, Nishiyama Sensei and Okazaki Sensei in the US, then Okazaki, Okazaki Sensei splitting from the JKA, Kanazawa split, Sensei splitting from the JKA. You know, if you go through Best Karate, you know, the, the Kumite books, you look at it, how many of those instructors are still in the JKA? And there's very few. And it's interesting now that we're the generation underneath that, the way that I, I was joking to a friend of mine, um, or a friend of mine was joking with me, as he said, you know, it's kind of like we're children of divorced parents. And so I think now is the time, and through collegiate karate, I believe we can start to bring those children together. Because if we don't, I think karate is going to be gone. You know, we can't survive as these little mini organizations. I don't think there needs to be one big organization, but we can still kick and punch together. And I think collegiate karate is one way we can start to do that, um, that I think's that, that I think's really, really important. Um, the second, my second major goal is to really help people ask the question why, you know, don't be forced to accept it. And uh, Eben, Ian Abernethy in one of his podcasts, he was talking about whether or not, you know, um, basic kumite was useful or not. You know, he says, no, it isn't. I totally disagree and I have reasons why. Um, but at the end of that, he says, you know, this is my opinion. You know, you can agree, but you can agree. But if you disagree, don't just say you disagree. Come up with why. The burden of proof lies with you. And I really like that approach. I like the idea of of getting people to ask why. You know, um, I see many people out there, you know, giving points of view, and I think that's really healthy. And I think getting general people, you know, you look on web forums and things like that, and you see where people's understandings are. And sometimes they're so sort of closed off, and it's getting people to open their minds and ask why, and how does this work? How does the mechanics of that work? How can I be better? Getting them to do that is huge. And if I can do a small part of that, I'll be really stoked. And then, you know, my major goal for the future is just 
train day to day. I train every single day and, you know, I'm, I'm still crap, but, you know, every day I'm making these little tiny small steps to get better, you know, and, and that's huge with me. Excellent. So let's hear more about this book and the other things you've got going on. If people want to reach out to you or find you online, you know, give, give, us, give us your pitch. Yeah, so the the book itself, it's called Karate Science Dynamic Movement. Um, it sort of spawned out of, um, there was a period right after the ISKF split from the JKA. Um, Okazaki Sensei asked me to help him with, I was living down in Arkansas at the time, and he asked me to help with the South and, um, you know, to keep the sort of organization together. And every once in a while, I'd get invited out to teach a seminar, you know, in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee. And you know, what I realized very quickly is that these clubs had been isolated from, you know, sort of like the Japanese, if you like, not that's the only right way, but, but sort of the core solid karate foundational type stuff for really long periods of time. And there were certain elements, you know, that, that like when you go to, to these clubs, you notice things like their stances are too wide or then their front knee and forward stance is, you know, all the way out there. It's not tucked under and coiled, you know, they mistake low stances for spread out stances. You know, rather than this nice tight coiled. And so what the book was, it had been brewing in my head for about 15 years. And the idea of it was, well, what would I tell people on these seminars? How can I improve their fundamental basic training? And, you know, and give them the idea of the, here's the whys about karate. Here's why we do this. Here's why we do that. With hope that, you know, not everyone has access. You know, as a little boy growing up in New Zealand, I would have never had the access to the Japanese instructors that I do now or, or the really good Western instructors that I do now. And um, the book is like a small attempt to help people, you know, who don't have that access to have that access, you know, and, and sort of let them think about that. Um, so different ways that you can get in contact with with the book. And one of my goals is to to publish, you know, technical videos, articles. Um, my publisher, YMAA, that they're at, you can find them at www.ymaa.com. The book's published through them. Uh, it's in every Barnes and Noble. I was in Santa Monica a couple of weeks ago. Um, I got to train with Sensei Field, which was awesome. Um, but I went into a, a Barnes and Noble in Santa Monica, and there it was. It kind of freaks you out. Um, but uh, you can reach, you can look at the book. Um, I have a website that accompanies it. It's, it's under www.karatescience, spelled as one word, dot com. Um, I also have a Facebook page, Karate Science. Um, so, you know, you can see these kinds of things. And the idea there is just seeing articles that I post up there periodically. Um, the idea of Karate Science is it's going to be uh, a series of different books. You know, the next one I'm looking at is all going to be about neuroscience and how that can improve your karate. Um, really sort of integrating simple biology, you know, and again, it has to be simplified. You know, the physics and karate science had to be simplified for people to to sort of follow it, I think, you know, because again, you know, I think that's really important to, to make it approachable or accessible. And, uh, so anyway, on karatescience.com, you know, that's one of the things I'm doing is I'm constantly posting up there just different articles and things like that. Um, a couple of exciting things. Um, there's the ISKF Master Camp coming up. Uh, it's June 10 to 17 in Philadelphia. Um, that's an amazing opportunity. It's open to anyone in Shotokan. Uh, you don't have to be ISKF. Um, but they have a, a bunch of Japanese instructors coming out, including Yuchi, uh, Oshii, uh, Takahashi, and Miura. Uh, also, some very famous American instructors are going to be there, including Sensei Riley and Sensei Field and Sensei Klein. Um, they're just really good uh, to do that. Um, collegiate karate-wise, um, check out www.iskf.com. Um, it's under the organization tab. You'll see collegiate karate um, if you're interested. Check it out. You know, um, I think it's a really good way. We're starting to build sort of at a national level now, um, really to, to sort of move that in. The, the organizations, the, the collegiate karate in the ISCAF has always been important. But um, just in this last year, I've got some very clear goals that I want to accomplish there, you know, really just to build it. Um, and then just, you know, if people are interested in talking about karate or hanging out or, or whatever, um, you can always email me. Um, so one way is through the webpage, karatescience.com or through my email address, which is jd.swanson, S-W-A-N-S-O-N, at salve, S-A-L-V-E, dot E-D-U. That's great. I want to thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing everything and, and just a great conversation. This was a lot of fun and, and one of those that even if we weren't recording and no one was listening, I would have enjoyed just as much. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and I'm, That's great. <laughs> I'm hoping we can, we can go out with just a, a little bit more gold from you. Any parting words for the people listening? Yeah, just 
always question your training, always ask why, you know, train, you've got to train really hard. You know, I don't think sometimes people don't train hard enough, but you've got to train hard both physically and mentally. Um, it's not just about throwing punch, throwing a million punches. It's about asking, how does this muscle work? How does that muscle work? How can I make this more efficient? Work on it that way. It's, it's really hard to break down your technique like that. And if something, if you don't have enough knowledge to figure that out, find people that do. Train with the very best you can. Kanazawa sensei is often quoted with the line um, that practice does not make perfect. It's only perfect practice that makes you perfect. And I think that's just so incredibly important in martial arts in general and with anything you do. You know, if you're just practicing, yeah, waste of time. It's working on that, seeking out sources and encompassing it into what you do that I think is really vital. And it just takes time. And as Yaguchi Sensei says, you know, step by step, little baby steps. I had a great time talking with Sensei Swanson, and I really enjoyed his views on the value, not only of the similarities in martial arts, but the differences. Thank you, Sensei Swanson, for coming on the show. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes with some photos, his book, website, Facebook page, and a whole bunch more. So check that out. And get on the newsletter list if you're not. Find Whistlekick on social media. We're at Whistlekick on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Those are our main three. But we're also pretty much everywhere else. You can also check out the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. And if you need a laugh, remember, martialartsmemes.com. Thanks for joining me today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.